Okay, I'm going to go through some spreadsheet examples of forecasting. And it's probably useful to start by defining the major categories of forecasting. We have what's known as qualitative forecasting, where you're some kind of industry expert and based on some knowledge and expertise, you make a forecast. Okay, the second major category is uh, what's known as explanatory or causal. And an example of this might be, well, it's been a very cold winter, and so therefore that's going to cause the prices of heating oil to increase. All right, and then the last category is time series, and that's what we're going to be focusing on in this video. Okay, so a time series is where you use historical data to make a forecast of the future. And within the time series realm, we have two kinds of time series. We have stationary, where there is no sort of repeating pattern in the data, or there's no obvious trend in the data up or down. There's non-stationary, where either you exhibit uh, some trend or you see some kind of repeating behavior. All right, so uh, based on what kind of data you have, you might use a different kind of forecasting method. The example I'm going to start with is it's called a moving average, and these are good at smoothing out random fluctuations in the data uh, when it's stationary. All right, so these are stationary forecasting methods. All right, and you assume that anything in the future is going to sort of look like the behavior that you've seen in the past. All right, so what you do with a moving average is you use some kind of look back period, and we call that K, and you take the average of that look back period and you use that as a forecast for a uh, time period plus one, so the latest observation, and then one period in the future is the forecast. And as this K, the look back period, increases, uh, the more that you're going to be relying on older data. All right, so with that introduction, uh, we're ready to go ahead and look at some data in Excel. Okay, so the data that I collected is for the gold ETF. All right, so it is going to be used as a proxy for forecasting the price of gold. Essentially, what you have is for each share in the gold ETF, it's about one-tenth of an ounce of gold, right around that. Okay, and I started off by graphing that. And so you can see that, okay, there is some random jumping around here, but it doesn't look like you're seeing anything repeating, and it doesn't look like there's an obvious trend here. All right, so we're going to use the moving average to forecast that, and I'm going to start with a five-week moving average. Okay, so to calculate the forecast for a five-week moving average, we're going to start in the sixth period, all right, and then we're just going to take the average of the previous five periods. So then our forecast for this week is uh, 121.52. We can also see the, the actual price was 126.96. All right, so it doesn't look like this is a perfect forecast. All right, and depending on what you're trying to do, um, maybe this is close enough, uh, maybe it's not. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of methods to see if we can find a better one. Okay, all right, so once we have one period calculated, we can just copy the data down, all right, and then the period we're going to forecast is right here, the first one for where we don't have any observed data, all right. So there's our forecast for the ending uh, week of 6-4. All right, so you can see that I, I pre-graphed that, and so here's what the forecast, the stream of forecast looks like. All right, so you can see that basically it starts a little bit uh, offset from the observed data, right? So we don't have a forecast for the, the first week. All right, so the first data point we have is, is the sixth week, and then we can see that, okay, the moving average kind of smooths down uh, those random fluctuations, and uh, we can see that it's reasonably following the data, all right? So um, we may want to get a little bit clearer idea of how good this forecast is other than just this visual uh, of the of the graph here. All right, so I'm going to next uh, calculate some error measures. Okay, all right, so the first one I'm going to calculate is what's called a mean absolute deviation. And to calculate this, what we're going to do is take the absolute value of the difference between the actual price and the forecast price. All right, and the reason we're using the absolute value is so that the 
the forecast doesn't actually look better than it is. All right, so if I start putting negative values in here, sometimes the, the forecast is going to be higher than the actual, sometimes it's going to be lower. And so if I don't use the absolute value, you're going to see some negative values in here. It's going to make the mean uh, or the absolute devi or the deviation, at least not the not the absolute, but the deviation looks smaller than it really is. All right. So what we're saying with this mean absolute deviation is that, OK, it's plus or minus whatever the value turns out to be. Once I get one calculated, I just copy it down. I leave off the forecast because I don't have any uh, observed data there. All right. And then up here, I'll just calculate the average. OK, so then based on the data that we have, all right, on average, we're off by plus or minus $1.64 from the price. So from that perspective, it looks pretty close. All right, it's within about a percent or a little bit more than a percent of the uh, actual data. All right, the next error measure I'm going to show is called the mean squared error. Okay, and this one looks a lot like the standard deviation. We're going to take the difference from the observed and the, uh, and the forecast. We're going to square it up, and then we're going to calculate uh, the average for that. So it's almost exactly the same calculation as a standard deviation or the variance. And then if I take the square root, it would be the same as the standard deviation. All right, so what I'm going to do is just take this absolute deviation and square it, and then I will copy that down. All right, and then I'll take the average. All right, and since the values are squared, this is going to look a little worse than the mean absolute deviation. All right, so there it is. Uh, the squared uh, differences is on average 428, so plus or minus 428. And then I will take the, the root of that, so square root. All right, and then this error measure is called the RMSE, the root mean squared error. Okay, so plus or minus $2.07. Then the final error measure I'm going to look at is the mean absolute percent error. All right, and this one has the benefit of being scaleless. All right, so if the data is changing in a direction, right, so there's a trend to it, this one becomes more important, right, because the values are getting bigger. And so if we're looking at a percent error, um, it's basically allowing you to make direct comparisons. All right, so the percent error is just going to be the difference, the absolute difference over the uh, closing price here. So. 4% in the first week. I'll copy that down. Okay. And then to get the map E, I mean absolute percent error, I just again take the average. Okay. So off by a little over 1%, 1.3%. 1 All right. So there's our five week moving average forecast. And we can see that, okay, based on our error measures, we're off. All right. So no forecast is going to be perfect. It's going to be off by some percent. And the question is, is that close enough for your purposes? Uh, with moving average data, the error measures tend to look worse the bigger the data is. So these are not great measures if you're trying to forecast something like uh, sales. All right, so you wouldn't want to use things like uh, the mean absolute deviation or the mean squared error if you were forecasting really big numbers. All right, the mean absolute percent error uh, does not get skewed by uh, large numbers. All right, so that one may be better in, in those situations where you have very large data. But then you might want to say, well, is this a good enough forecast or should we look at something else here and compare it to something? See if we can get a better forecast, All right? So I'm going to write next to the five week moving average, calculate the 10 week moving average to see if we can get something better. So just like the five week moving average, the first week we're going to be able to forecast with a 10 week is week 11. So I'm going to move down another five data points and then in week 11, I'll calculate the average there. So we can see that it is a different number. Let me copy that down quickly and look at our forecast. All right, so um, the forecast for the 10 week moving average is somewhat higher than the than the forecast for the five week. All right, and we'll just look at the graph to see if it's better or not. All right, so it looks like from here, it looks like, OK, well, the five week was a little bit better. All right. And that kind of makes sense since we're jumping around a lot with our data. There's lots of random fluctuation. 
uh, the five week is going to respond quicker to that. But we're interested overall, how is this forecast? All right, so what I'm going to do is I've pre-calculated the error measures for the 10 week, and then uh, we can directly compare the error measures here. And uh, just looking at each one of them, we can see that, okay, it looks like the 10 week overall is just a little bit better than the five week forecast. All right, and I should mention that, well, I'm trying to forecast something that's very difficult to forecast, all right, it's a security and these things are notoriously difficult to forecast with, uh, with time series forecasting. All right, but it might be useful, uh, depending on what you're doing, to know about where you think gold is gonna be uh, one period out. Okay, so I hope that helps with moving averages, and I'm going to move on to uh, another video and discuss a couple other methods of uh, stationary forecasting.